This video was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com today to start your free trial. The Maya civilization flourished in the 5th century AD, and the stone cities jutting out of the rainforest housed millions. During this incredible era, the kings, gleaming with jade and vibrant feathers, marching through the jungles with thousands of their obsidian-wielding warriors, are about to introduce total warfare to the Maya world. Two Maya superstates, home to the temple of the great Jaguapur, Teak Al, and the massive snake kingdom, Kalak Mul, will collide and cycle between moments of triumph and disaster for not only themselves, but their entire world. Maya warfare worked differently than that of Eurasia. As there were no draft animals, Maya armies would have to carry all of their own equipment and food. Porters were used so soldiers wouldn't have to carry everything, but the longer the campaign, the more porters would be needed to carry food, and soon more porters would be needed simply to carry food for the other porters. Campaigning was limited to the dry season, as the rains would make it impossible for large groups to traverse the swamps and forests of the region. Therefore, Maya conquests and campaigns were short, and they usually never travelled more than two weeks' march. Only when rivers are nearby do we see far-flung warfare, as canoes could be used to transport food and equipment. So rather than empires or massive kingdoms, the Maya instead formed hegemonies and political leagues. Each state was technically independent, but a complex system of lords and overlords, dynastic marriages and intimidation allowed the stronger states to dominate the weaker ones. When the Maya states went to war, they were short, bloody and chaotic affairs. Wars were usually conducted by and for the Maya elites, and so they were expected to do most of the fighting. The king and his entourage of elites formed the core of Maya armies. The Maya military was entirely infantry-based. Armor wasn't worn for most of Maya history, but when it was worn, it was a thick cotton vest stuffed with rock salt. This Kevlar-like vest would have been extremely difficult to slice through. Nobles would have wanted to stand out on the battlefield in order to gain prestige, and so it was common for them to be dressed with brightly coloured feathers and to drape themselves in many different animal skins. For their weapons, the Maya relied on short spears, usually tipped with chert or flint, but nobles would often have obsidian-tipped weapons, and these were especially fearsome. According to the Lacedon Maya, a church point will usually kill, an obsidian point always kills. Along with these spears, swords like the Makawitil were used, along with either hide or wooden shields. For their ranged weapons, the Maya used blowguns, javelins, slings, and a weapon imported from the Mexican highlands, the Ashlatl or spear thrower. This powerful weapon can launch large spears at speeds up to 150 kilometers an hour that knock a man off his feet before killing him. If the Popol Vuh of the Kiiki Maya is to be believed, the Maya had developed a type of early hand grenade. They hollowed out a gourd and filled it with wasps and bees. This was then tossed into a crowd of attackers and the furious insects would quickly cause mayhem. Most Maya books were burned, so we have no military manuals or records, and therefore the exact tactics and strategies they used are lost. But it seems Maya warfare was based on warriors dueling one-on-one, -on -one, with the capture of high-value targets such as kings being the primary goal. As the intensity and frequency of warfare increased, defences were quickly erected around the cities. Walls and defensive ditches and moats became common towards the end of the Classic period. Mayapan, for example, was surrounded by 9 km long walls of stone up to 2.5 meters high, topped with palisades. Cities like Agoateca and Tikal would use walls in combination with natural barriers such as swamps and cliffsides.
A favourite defensive strategy of the Maya was to surround their cities with concentric walls. One inner wall that was much larger and easier to defend, and a smaller outer wall. When an attacker managed to get past the first wall, they would find themselves stuck in what has been called a kill zone. Defenders behind the much larger wall would fire down on the now pinned attackers. These defences combined with the general difficulty of the Yucatan's terrain made sieges quite rare and short. However, we do have evidence of Maya sieges taking place, and in murals from Chichen Itza we can see what some Maya sieges looked like, this one specifically involving siege towers against a fortified hill. During their classic period, the Maya began to chronicle their own history by carving the deeds of kings and generals upon thousands of giant steles that still dot the Yucatan. On some of these steles we hear of a foreign intrusion into the Maya world. The intruder was Teotihuacan, a sprawling metropolis located in the Mexican highlands, at this time the most populated city in the Americas with up to 125,000 residents. Under the command of Siyo Kaak, or Fire is Born, Teotihuacano soldiers marched over a thousand kilometers towards Maya territory. On the 8th of January 378 they entered Tikal, then a rising power among the Maya cities and on the very same day, the king of Tikal is said to have entered the water, a Maya euphemism for death. A complete political takeover of Tikal was instituted, and the ruler of Teotihuacan, spear thrower Aul, had his own son put on the throne of Tikal. This mixed Teotihuacan Maya dynasty brought the already rising city-state to new heights. Soon cities like Biyuk Al, Rio Azul, Uazactun, and Motul de San all fell under Tikal hegemony. It dominated not only the trade routes of the Maya lowlands, but also the lucrative Caribbean sea trade. According to Michael Coe, until the arrival of Fire is Born, the Maya remained politically fragmented, each city-state charting its own path. After 378, Maya culture blossomed, alliances were formed between city-states, and great advances in science and technology took place. But Tikal's dominance could not last forever. Directly to its north, a serious contender was taking shape. Kalak Mul, a kingdom whose rulers referred to themselves as the Divine Lords of the Snake. Kalak Mul was the largest classical Maya city with an urban population of at least 50,000, and a core covering 30 square kilometers. The entire kingdom had a population of over a million inhabitants. As the power of Kalak Mul grew, so did the ambitions of its snake kings. By installing dynasties in other cities, arranging well-placed marriages, and through ingenious diplomacy, a net of Kalak Mul-aligned cities wrapped around Tikal. These two superpowers soon began to try and smother each other, but avoided direct conflict. They fought through a series of proxy wars instead, in a Maya-style Cold War. But an opportunity to directly strike at Tikal arose in 553 AD. The king of Tikal, Wak Khan Kawil, had placed his preferred candidate on the throne of the city of Karakul. Three years later, relations between them collapsed completely, and Karakul joined Kalak Mul's league. The balance of power had tipped in Kalak Mul's favour. This is a Star War glyph. These Star Wars were usually decisive attacks that were coordinated to occur while Venus, the heavenly body the Maya associated with war, was passing overhead. In 562, a Kalak Mul Star War assault ended with Tikal being overrun, and its leader, Wak Khan Kawil, found himself upon a sacrificial stone at Kalak Mul. A dark age was started, and for 130 years we hear nothing from Tikal. While Kalak Mul enjoyed its total control over the region, 
a split seems to have formed within the Tikal dynasty. Bala Khan Kawil, the son of the king of Tikal, seems to have been sent to establish a new dynasty and rule the city of Don Pilas in 629 AD. Both cities still claimed the same royal title and used the same ancient Mayan name. Shortly after this, Tikal begins to step back out of the shadows. The brother of Balan Khan Kawil, Nun Yuhol Chaak, ascended to the Tikal throne. An energetic and strong leader, he seems to have reinvigorated the declining city. A powerful figure, Yuknum the Great, had been ruling in Kalakmu for over a decade, and he was determined not to allow his rival any chance of recovery. Yuknum attacked Don Pilas in 650, and seems to have convinced its king, Bala Khan Kawil, to join the Kalakmul League. This turn of events must have horrified Nunchaak in Tikal. Kalakmul was supposed to be the sworn enemy of them both, and yet now his brother was on Kalakmul's side. Yuknum pressed his advantage. In another Star War attack, he attacked Tikal, storming over the walls and sacking the only recently recovered city as Venus gleamed in the sky above. His kingdom was once again shattered, and Num Yuhol Chaak was forced to accept Yuknum as his overlord. It would take 15 years of waiting in order for Nun to feel like Tikal had the strength to reclaim its independence. He wanted to strike quickly and decisively and his first target was his brother. In 672, he attacked and captured Don Pilas and sent his brother running. For five years, he chased him across the Yucatan, and just as he was finally within his grasp, Nun was unexpectedly met in battle by Yuk Nun in 677 and was defeated. Bala was restored to his throne at Don Pilas once again. Noon did not lick his wounds for long. This brother's spat came to its bloody conclusion in 679, where Noon met Bala and forces from Kalakmul in their final battle. Again, we do not have the written records of the battle, but the inscriptions tell us it was one of the largest in Maya history. Pools of blood soaked the earth, broken spears and piles of skulls littered the battlefield, and Nun Yoholchak, the man that attempted to bring Tikal out of its dark age, was dead. Surprisingly, this was not the end of Tikal. Nun's son, Yasor Khan Kawil, took his place on the throne in 682. He seems to have bided his time, built up relations with his subjects and allies, and also reasserted Tikal's Teotihuacan heritage. Yuknum would die in 686, and Bala would follow in 692. Yasor used this transition phase to the advantage of Tikal. In the Maya's own words, he brought down the flint axe and shield on Kalakmul's new king. In a battle timed to occur exactly on the 256th anniversary of the death of spear thrower Owl, the forces of Yasur defeated Kalakmul in battle and captured a sacred effigy of one of their gods. This was not only a military defeat, but a painful spiritual one. A month later, a triumph was held for Yasur in Tikal, and he entered the city to a cacophony of chanting and adulations, with a trail of captives and plunder pouring in behind him. To cement his victory, he had the captured Kalakmul king sacrificed. The Second Tikal Kalakmul War ended with Tikal's prestige restored and Kalakmul starting to decline. However, Tikal would not bask in the glory of this victory for long. The collapse of the Kalakmul hegemony, along with the decades of constant warfare, had caused an irreversible shift in the Maya world. It is about to enter a spiral that will rip people away from their cities and cast a shadow across their history.
When we create these videos, we often use the series of lectures called The Peoples and Cultures of the World from Professor Edward Fisher, provided by the sponsor of this video, The Great Courses Plus. This 24-part series dives into the theory of how civilizations and cultures were formed and functioned. You can subscribe to The Great Courses Plus to get access to the vast library of over 10,000 lectures on history, science, literature and other subjects from the top-notch professors from the best universities in the world. The Great Courses Plus is giving viewers a great offer of a free trial. Show your support to our channel and learn more about the decisive battles of history by subscribing to The Great Courses Plus through thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash kings and generals or the short link in the description. We are planning more videos focusing on the civilizations of Mesoamerica and beyond, so make sure that you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button to be notified of our videos. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and YouTube sponsors who make the creation of our videos possible. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.